Yeah, I think almost everybody was online also a week ago when I talked about in 2002, paddling the Philon with a friend and then did another two or three adventure trips with my wife. But uh, 2007, my daughter was born and that sort of put a stop on wilderness trips for a while. Well, let's just say we were, we were not brave enough to go out on a trip in the tundra with a two-year-old. But uh, I just had that itch of going back north. Uh, so in 2019, I was able to convince them to sign up for an Arctic river trip again. Even after seeing all the pictures of mosquitoes from, that I had brought home from the Philon and the few that were squished in the guidebook, they're still in there. Uh, so I had been following Alex Hull on the web too for a long time and emailed him in this winter 2018, 2019. Hey, would like to come, come on a trip with you if bringing a 12 year old is okay with you. And got an initial yes reply. And then shortly thereafter, uh, sorry, I can't hold the trip. I just got diagnosed with cancer. Uh, but he said, you know, I'll hand over that trip to a young outfitter here in town, uh, Dan Wong and his company, Jack Pine Paddle. They've been in business for a few years doing sea kayaking trips on Great Slave Lake and uh, youth camps on Great Slave Lake. Uh, but they hadn't been in the business of guiding river trips before. But you know what? I need somebody to coordinate the logistics, no wilderness medicine, uh, take care of all those things. Wasn't that important to me that the guides had been on that river before. It made for some funny moments when I knew the next rapid and they didn't. And they, the guides had gotten a lot of intel from Alex, where are the wolf dens, to some extent also the rapids. Uh, so they guided us very well. It was their first trip on the river, but still excellent guiding, no problem here. Uh, so yeah, this trip, uh, we flew to Fort Smith and the trip started out of Fort Smith. Uh, we're a group of 10, eight tourists, two guides, uh, ended up paddling a total of 120 kilometers. The plan was originally for 150, but I'll get to what happened in the end. Overall, that trip starting in late June was a little colder than the other trip where we started July 7th. We had a little more rain but fewer mosquitoes, none at all, the first three, four days, and no black flies. So there's an advantage in going early. Uh, okay. Now to just show this is actually the same map as last time, but rather than the whole feel on, we got dropped off at the Clark River, approximately here, paddled down the Clark into the feel on, the confluence is just downstream of the canyon and then followed the field on downstream. And the original plan was to go to Hornby Point, which would have been here. Uh, my wife and daughter, I got dragged out into the wilderness, Chris and Sophie. And yeah, this time, planes that are large enough, or at least sort of large enough. Uh, Jackpine Paddle, the outfitter here, I didn't put that picture in to show their logo, but to show something else, uh, the Canada Aviation rules, as far as I know, say you can strap only one canoe to a ponton of a float plane. But that is talking about wind resistance or whatever volume. So what Jack Pine did, take an 18 foot boat, take out the seat and the crossbars, put a 17 foot boat into it. Again, take out the seat and the crossbars and put a 16 foot boat into it. And that counts as legit to strap it onto one airplane. 
So that way with two flights, they were able to get our fleet of two 18 foot canoes, two 17 footers and a 16 footer out to the river. And it kept us busy for the first two hours out there reassembling the boats. Uh, that was the team. Then uh, the owner and one of the guide, owner of Jack Van Paddle, one of the guides, Pierre Benoit, if I pronounce that somewhat right, he just got, did just go by PB, uh, second of the guides. He, if he spends two months a year in a bed, it's a lot. He's out, out on the land almost all the time. Uh, then Patrick and his wife Dorothy and their daughter Eileen, Mel and Shelley, who got her pants wet and improvised with a garbage bag as a skirt over it to keep the wind off. <laughs> I took the picture, so I'm not on there. And Chris and Sophie again. Uh, I need to get into the habit of taking group shots at the beginning of the trip. This again was at the end of the trip. So we weren't out that long, so you can't really judge it that well from the beards. Uh, so I already mentioned flying out earlier, uh, July, June 24th, still a good amount of ice on the river, on the big lakes. The rivers were all open. First funny story of the trip. So we take off in Fort Smith. I think there's only one runway uh, pointing northwest. Okay, we want to go northeast. We take off, we climb a little bit, we make a 90 degree turn, we're now heading northwest. Okay, we are heading out. The plane levels off, makes another right turn, starts to decline, makes another right turn. 15 minutes later, we were back on the ground. The pilot had forgotten the fuel pump that he needs for the refueling stop out on the lake. <laughs> Okay, little delay, another 15 minutes and we're back up in the air. Uh, getting dropped off at the Clark, which interestingly, Alex Hull asked his clients to promise to not mention the river and just only talk about the tributary of the Philon because he considered his, it his secret, so beautiful area that he didn't want it to become popular. But yeah, small, small river. And similar to the Philon in that area, we are north of tree line, or not north of the continuous forest, but not totally north of tree line. So there was always enough firewood. And on this trip, most, if not all, of the cooking happened over wood campfires. Uh, Yep, as I already mentioned, five canoes, 10 people. Uh, most of the time I was paddling with my wife and my daughter was paddling with one of the two guides. So we had one day where we switched it up and I paddled with uh, Shel Shelly or Mel, one of the two, because they started to disagree a little bit and the guides decided, yeah, it might be good to separate them, let them paddle with somebody else. Uh, again, those, those are all things you can do in a larger group that you can't do if you're just out there with one partner. Uh, barren lands with few people. But I, I love this stark barren landscape. Camps were usually spread out quite a bit and the guided tour another advantage you can bring some group gear that wouldn't be worth to bring for just a small group of two or four but we had this uh, Hillebrand group tent slash the bomb shelter and they actually had two of those that can be connected through a tunnel uh, it's high enough to stand in it large enough to cook in it and if you put 10 people into it it gets warm pretty quick came in really well, came in really handy. Um, upside down canoe as a ca uh, camp table, which I hadn't seen before, but, or didn't remember seeing before. 
probably not new to any of you. Uh, we did paddle maybe four or five hours a day on average, two hours lunch break, another two hours or so, and a good amount of hiking, exploring. And if you look up the hill and think, if I would sit here to chisel, try to make, uh, turn a piece of flint into a spearhead while being out of the mosquitoes, as wind exposed as possible, and being at an overview where I could see the caribou if they come. Yes, these spots are where you also find the arrowheads because that is what the Inuit did. Um, so we found we found a lot. Now this one was broken, must have been frustrating. You're almost done chipping out the, the arrowhead and then that piece breaks off. But uh, a lot of these types of artifacts. For at least the third part, first week of the trip, my daughter was the chief uh, fire maker and firewood collector. She actually insisted on being woken up before anybody else gets out of the tent so she can start making fire for the coffee. That relaxed a little bit towards the end when we had rainy in the morning. Then, oh, well, let the guides cook and call us when breakfast is ready. But yeah, one of the advantages, one more advantage of group travels, it's worth to bring a Dutch oven for a group of 10, not for two or four, but, and these outfitters compete with each other by who feeds their guests the best. I guess that might directly correlate to the tip at the end of the trip, uh, but we had dessert almost every day. On this trip, we did not see a single caribou. So I found antlers quite often, but yes, the herd is in decline, but I think we're also there. We were there too early. I think they moved through that area a little later in the season. Another camp scene. As I said, usually enough forest around, or at least driftwood around, uh, to cook on campfire. Uh, again, on this trip, we did not have a gun with us. At least that's what the guides told us. Uh, they very forcefully said there has never been a bear attack on a group of five or more humans traveling together. So this be careful when you head into the woods when nature calls, but other than that, while the group is together, we were not overly concerned. Uh, <laughs> at some point on, so we, we paddled three days and then the fourth day, a little rainy in the morning. And yeah, uh, we, we have a quite generous itinerary. Let's take a rest day. Afternoon, it turned sunny, but let's hike, let's explore the area. And up the hill, we could see this sand patch. So I decided, well, let's go up there and check that out. Which I was told is a cave that a grizzly spends the winter in to hibernate, but they don't use them during the year. Uh, this is me crawling in there, and there's a second human already in the cave. Uh, too low for me to sit up, but uh, horizontally, two meter long, two meter wide. Permafrost, uh, ice on the bottom with a good amount of moss, or yeah, I was in moss like and stuff that the bear dragged into for isolation. I unfortunately do not have any pictures from in the cave, in the cave yeah. <laughs> Uh, we bring our burning telescope on pretty much every trip. Tell the guides or the outfitter in advance, you know, this is shared gear, everybody can use it. Under the condition, it doesn't count for our weight allowance. Because I'm six foot four, my sleeping bag is extra long, my thermal rest is extra long. I'm pushing a little bit the weight limits usually anyway. <laughs> 
Uh, but yeah, that telescope has been in Patagonia and on Ellesmere Island and has been carried up a few mountains on my back. Um, and it enabled us to get a really good look at the bear. Uh, I think it was on this hike, probably somewhere between a kilometer and a mile away, big grizzly that, yeah, through the telescope, you could really see the muscles, see the hump. You think, okay, the bear could be here in probably a little over five minutes, 10 at the most, but it ignored us, stayed away. Was the only bear sighting of the trip. We checked out wolf dens a few, a few times. Uh, my wife and one of the guides saw a wolf for a moment before it disappeared behind the ridge. Uh, I did not. I was a little bit too slow looking the wrong direction at that moment and then the wolf was gone. Um, most of the time, relatively pleasant hiking. Not uh, much of that uh, tussock, these soccer ball size uh, grass balls that roll under your feet when you step on them and you get wet when you step in the water in between them. Not much of that uh, along the Clark or then the lower part of the Phelan. And a lot of pictures without bug nets. So it wasn't that bad this year overall. Um, glacier moraines, the fine dust that the Ice Age glaciers ground up under the ice. Uh, lead to some interesting features here. This was all rather loose stuff. Uh, pebbles, some fist size rocks, a little bit larger, something really fine dust. And then even very small creeks carve pretty steep canyons into that. Uh, that would be pretty impassable. Reminded me a little bit of, of uh, bad water in Death Valley. <laughs> Um, yeah, beautiful scenery, just more impressions from beautiful country. And same as I mentioned on the last time, uh, usually the, a little bit of a, of a valley, climb out of the valley and then totally flat the barrens. With the occasional stretch where a little bit of a canyon along the Clark, if you want to call it that. Uh, cliffs left and right. Uh, excellent raptor, uh, birds of prey nesting area. Uh, we saw deer falcon, peregrine falcon, uh, golden eagle, a few hawk species. Didn't check my trip notes before today. Uh, couldn't tell you which hawks, sorry. Uh, okay, me paddling and I don't know who paid enough attention, but this is the same hat that was with me on the Phelan in 2002, in the same bug jacket, the same map case, and the Gore-Tex shell was also the same. But after this trip now, the, <laughs> the map case and the Gore-Tex pants got retired slash discarded. And uh, these sandy cliffs had a funny, <laughs> funny little feature. Flightless Canada geese on this trip, interestingly, they didn't try to swim away from us going downstream, or most of the time they didn't. They tried to climb up here. There's a bunch of geese here <laughs> trying to go up this relatively steep, just at the edge of not sliding to get a sand. Guess we must have been really scary to them. And we had one day, minor rapid, where a bunch of geese trying to get away from us, swimming downstream from us, keeping their distance going downstream parallel with us. And we think we saw one go under in a rapid and not come up, but we might just not have seen it come up. I don't think how likely it is for them to get pulled under.
This is probably my favorite <laughs> Arctic wilderness trip. So we had not much volume of rain, but we had rain sprinkles eight out of 10 days. And then a lot of beautiful rainbows. But the highlight wildlife wise of this trip. So one morning at four, the guide comes running from tent to tent, waking us up without being too loud. It is a group of musk oxen across the river. And then they started swimming across towards us. And it seems like we were on their usual migration path and they considered us not worth a detour. Walked right through camp, didn't seem overly stressed or nervous, didn't take their young in the middle or anything, didn't run. Walking through right between the tents. This one was running a little bit to catch up with the rest of the group, but they didn't seem frightened and we didn't feel frightened. Uh, it was a wonderful, peaceful experience. I have three dozen musk oxen walk through camp here. And once they had cleared our camp by 100 to 200 meters, they stopped to, gra to graze again. Uh, in addition to that, we saw, as I already mentioned, zero caribou, probably a little over a dozen moose, one here, two there, one occasion with a mother and two yearlings or what seemed to two calves. Uh, that was it for, for big mammals and the, the wolf that some of us saw. Uh, the weather wise probably worse day was when we got to the confluence of the Clark and the Phelan. And okay, some of the water here is water on the lens of the camera, but that is still a pretty good uh, reflection of what I see with water droplets on my eyeglasses too. So yeah, visibility isn't the greatest. And I did remember there's a rapid right downstream from the confluence. Uh, now, my wife has been with me on a little bit of rough water on sea kayaking trips, but zero whitewater experience in canoes, and my daughter even less. And I think the rest of the group, most of us were not that experienced either. But yeah, so here we are heading out into the field on us already. And Okay, in my memory, I had mixed up the rapid here with the next one downstream, which is bigger. The first one here isn't that bad. But you know how rapids always sound larger than what they end up being? They sound more threatening. So we're all cold, tired. Nobody's paddling that hard, wants to paddle that hard anymore. And I remember there's that two meter standing wave there, which Yes, it wasn't quite as big. Uh, the memory was misleading a little bit here, but that was, yeah, a little bit nervous there. Uh, so we decided to cross over because we, the guides knew from Al's notes and I from my memory that these rapids are better to run on the river left. So we crossed over, but then we are tired enough to set up shelter, try to get everybody warm get into the group shelter and warm up, make camp. And this picture was then taken the next day. So yeah, I wouldn't want to in the fog get drifting into this stuff, not seeing what's coming. That picture is from this campsite. So I want to mention it here. Uh, <laughs> my wife and daughter both concluded that hauling gear is actually more work than the paddling. <laughs> We usually looked for nice camp spots, uh, not directly on the water, but get up a little bit. All right, but yeah, that, that's a close up of, uh, of this rapid here where Patrick and Dorothy decided they don't want to paddle it. They hiked around, the guides took their canoe, paddled it down to check it out. 
then hiked back up. And I'm not sure whether this was to entertain the guests or because they thought it's necessary because some of us were not really very white water skilled, but we decided to turn the canoes into catamarans. Per two boats, two small trees strapped down. And off we go. Now we would still flood if the waves splash over, but uh, tipping over is impossible by that point. Uh, worked out fine, but fine was a little fun, fun breakup of the trip. Uh, but yeah, afterwards, the river is totally calm, flat again, much more peaceful or boring, whatever your inclination is. Uh, this was, I think, day seven. So yeah, downstream from the confluence of the Clark and the Phelan is again, uh, Warden's Grove and Warden's Cabin, which I roughly remembered where it is. And we found, found it here. Uh, that is uh, so 20, 1928-29. For two years, uh, they had a game warden stationed there uh, in an attempt to prevent poaching. But I think after two years, they decided there's so little human traffic coming through that it's not really worth it to keep somebody there. and. So I had been at that cabin in 2002. And I have to say the 17 years had taken its toll. 2002, the roof was intact and there was a log book in the cabin. Uh, by now the roof had caved in. And I cannot remember whether there was a second building or only this one cabin. Because all the pictures that I have of this one cabin, none of the logs shows these gargoyles. So maybe that was a second building. Uh, in one of the guidebooks, it's mentioned that those gargoyles are relatively recent edition. I mean, not from 1928. It must have been some windbound paddler spending a day there with uh, some playful addition. And I believe it must have been after 2002 because I don't remember seeing them in 2002 either. Um, little further downstream, I think roughly a day trip, uh, is one other scenic point along the Phelan, uh, Cosmos Lake, where uh, 1978 uh, Russian Soviet Union uh, satellite crashed down uh, and common then and somewhat still now uh, these satellites have radionuclear powered batteries. So uh, there was a cleanup operation combined with uh, US and Canadian military. Whether the radioactive cleanup was the excuse and the attempt was mostly to see can we recover any information about Soviet technology. Uh, whatever the truth there is, anyway, they had a few months long a camp out there, uh, cleanup, crews collecting fragments and all that's left now is this monument. On the, the 2002 trip, we were too lazy or not, not motivated enough to hike in. As you can see, it's quite a bit of a walk from the river uh, with a good amount of bushwhacking, which also in a larger group was fine, but uh, two meter high brush vegetation, you wouldn't see a bear. Uh, I wouldn't, honestly, it's one of the things I would not have done alone. Uh, and at that point, we have roughly 30, 35 kilometers left, heading straight northeast into a significant wind coming from that direction. Uh, 
It's okay after Cosmos Lake, paddle a little bit, make camp. And then we have two days left. And as I said, 35 kilometers into that wind. So the next day we tried, spent an hour, a little bit over an hour to paddle two kilometers, I think, to this sand spot here. And realized this is not going to work. Or it would be brutal work to uh, even with the current. I mean, the wind was such that it would blow us upstream if we stopped paddling. So we made a U-turn, paddled back to the same campsite in half the time that going upstream than what it's taken us going downstream. Set up camp here again. Spent the next day hiking around this area and then pick up day. We had to paddle half a kilometer or so to a better landing spot for the float plane. That's why when you remember on the first slide, I had this seven plus two paddling days. Because the out and back where we ended at the same campsite, I'm not really sure I want to count that as a paddle day. And then the next day, half a kilometer to the float plane landing site, I wouldn't count that either. Uh, but they're overall a much more leisurely itinerary than uh, what Will and I planned for ourselves. And yeah, that is a risk I know about myself that if I plan the itinerary, we might end up doing more miles. Maybe that's the reason why my wife prefers guided trips over me planning them. <laughs> uh, pick up day. The outfitter thought, I see, Jack Pine Paddle doesn't own the planes, they contract that part out. And somewhere along the passing on the information, well, we have less food, they can send a smaller airplane. They sent the same uh, Twin Otter for six or seven people and three canoes but now a smaller Cessna to pick up the remaining three people and two canoes. Except the distance here between the propeller and the rudder wasn't large enough for an 18 foot canoe. But they figured that out only out there. So the big plane had to do a second loop, going halfway to the refueling stop, dropping people off there, going back and getting the two remaining canoes. We didn't take the, the plane, the canoes back to town. We left them at Jim Lake uh, for the next trip to start. So this was my getting back to Jim Lake where our first Phelan trip had started. Although here we are on the island in Jim Lake. Uh, I couldn't figure out for sure where along the shore of the lake we camped uh, 17 years earlier. I didn't recognize the spot. Uh, with that uh, layover time to for the big plane to go back and get the other boats, we had a lot of time to kill there. So did some walking around. Mats and mats of wildflowers everywhere. I love the smell of that stuff. Uh, although I can't tell you exactly which plant it is to put a little bit of a comparison in here, guided trips versus going on my own. And this applies to me, this might not apply to you, don't anybody feel offended. Uh, but uh, guided by an outfitter usually, in my experience, and I've done six of those trips by now, it's a group size of around 10 to 12, maybe 14. Uh, allows to bring a little bit more kitchen stuff like a Dutch oven, uh, bring a large group tent for comfort, has that advantage, it's maybe a little bit less risky. Uh, you can meet other people there, plus or minus how you see that. I don't need to do all the planning. Uh, I can really do, do my job and spend my two week vacation out on a river trip there. 
uh, rather than having to do the planning, where if I do it, I tend up planning too ambitious a mileage. On the other hand, it's certainly more of an expense, more of an adventure, more of an experience if you go without the guide and do it all on your own. So I, I, I'm glad I did it in 2002. I would do it again. If I bring the family, I would go with the guide again. If for no other reason than that they get blamed if something goes wrong and not me. <laughs> uh, and whether going on your own is cheaper or not, uh, depends on how much gear you need to buy versus get from the outfitter. And our first field on trip got rather pricey uh, because of the float plane flights uh, shared by just two, two travelers. But if you have a trip uh, where you don't need a significant fly in, then uh, going without the guide is certainly significantly cheaper. Uh, Gary had mentioned I should throw it in here. Uh, Dan is offering the Clark field on trip again for next year for a cost of currently it's a 10,100 something plus 5% uh, tax. So 10,600-ish Canadian. Uh, and last two slides. Uh, in Fort Smith, we stayed at a very nice place called the Whooping Crane Bed and Breakfast that I can highly recommend, but maybe don't mention my name there. <laughs> well, in the end, we left on good terms. <laughs> uh, operated by a super friendly, artsy woman. Uh, but I learned my lesson that maybe I'm safer out in the wilderness than back in civilization. So with all these delays on the flight back, it took us until 9 p.m. to get back to town. Fortunately, I let the others have their sh I let the others have their shower first, or all except one. Because when I stepped under the shower and turned the hot water on, I suddenly had the had the handle in my hand. Right on the other side of the wall is the boiler, <laughs> shooting uh, five bar, 60 psi or so steaming water at me. <laughs> I managed to get out without burning myself, wrapping a towel around this to get the water dripping down instead of shooting against the opposing wall and then up onto the ceiling. And then it came, hey, uh, 10 p.m., wake up the landlady, we need to find the main water valve. Her husband was traveling and as I said, she's an artist, not a contractor, but fortunately my wife comes from a family of contractors. It was this, here is the uh, hot water heater. So logically behind that wall is where I expect the main valve to be. Rip this open here. <laughs> but we made, we, we made it out okay. The next day, everybody had water again. We bought $300 worth of her artwork for her to ease out some tensions. And in the end, she agreed, OK, let's call it an accident. <laughs> but yeah, maybe I'm safer between the bears in the tent. <laughs> and that's all I have to tell from this trip. There isn't really anything in the backup slides. All right, we can go back to the non-sharing and then we could do some Q and A, or okay. jump in and out, so you want whatever to works. Lights up with a question. Refers to something. What? Right. Well, let me just flip to a map. I was interested in that muskox herd, uh, Kurt, because I've seen a lot of pictures that people have taken up in that region. Rarely seen a herd that large. Yeah. Yeah. It it's the largest group that I've seen on okay. and having been on the Philon twice and the Horton once. All right, when there's a break in the action, just jump in and ask Kurt any question you have. Kurt, did you have the, uh, the option of bringing any of your own gear or did Jack Pine just supply everything? Uh, they supplied boats, PFDs, paddles and tents. 
and the uh, camp cooking equipment. We brought uh, all personal uh, clothing, including sleeping bag, thermal rests. Uh, did you bring your own pack or did they supply the packs? Uh, we brought the, these big uh, dry bags with carrying straps. They supplied the blue barrels. Yeah, okay. I, what I were the have two of those, temperatures like? Be, what what were the talk about like? the, um, the white water experiences there on the Tilan? Um, okay, one moment. Gary, you asked about the temperature? Yeah. Uh, the cold, rainy day was around 5 degrees Celsius or 5 to 10. And the water temperature there was also 5 degrees. Uh, white water. So on this trip, not much. I said the, the guides were okay bringing people that didn't have any white water experience. I showed you pictures of the biggest rapid of the trip. Uh, on the, the upper part of the Filon in 2002, we had more, more white water, although I don't think we ran anything more than class two. Uh, and the canyon starts with a two meter waterfall. And for us, it seemed there is no way to get around the waterfall and put in downstream. So we portaged around the whole canyon. Um, Will Miles, my partner in the 2002 trip was paddling a tandem kayak solo uh, and did not really have a very well fitting spray skirt for that configuration that would, would have sealed him in well. So, and you're, we had to avoid everything that would flood, flood the boat. Both trips, uh, very benign white water wise and doable for people with not much white water experience. Did the guides carry the 18 footers on the portage? Uh, no, so that that trip didn't have any portage. Oh, I thought you said you the 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 the, can, the open boat one. The first one. That was uh, the first one. No, on on, on the but, no. When you mentioned white water, I started thinking about the canyon. Sorry, on the on this trip, there were a few ledges where we stepped out of the boat to just let the boat slide over. Uh, but that was on the Clark more because it was too shallow. Um, the one of those might count as lifting the fully loaded boat out of the water, drag it over rocks for five to 10 meters and slide it into the water again, but no real portaging. Other than holding the gear to the camp that's a hundred meters from the river. Did the canoes all go at the same speed? Because I find that there can be a big difference between a shorter and a long canoe, and you've also got disparity of people in the group. So did you did you stay together, or did people sort of spread out? Um, we were asked to stay within uh, 500 meter or so, uh, a little closer to those rapids, but yeah, not not to spread out too far. Uh, I always put it on the paddlers, but you're right. Uh, there could be a speed difference just by in the boats themselves. I mean, I know the, the theory of faster hull speed for a longer boat. Uh, They're probably loaded more heavily. You no, know, I think we, everybody had roughly the same amount of private gear. So the two that were paddling the 16 footer had it relatively heavier loaded. But then I guess the longer boats got more of the group gear. Um, there was occasionally a little bit of switching of boats, uh, partially because, okay, I remember I had a green one yesterday, but uh, which one of the two green 18 footers? And sometimes when I switched from paddling with my wife to paddling with my daughter, I might have ended up in a different boat. Uh, 
after one day in the 16 footers, I told them, sorry, not enough room for my legs. I don't want that one anymore. Um, How are the bugs? Um, none at all the first three or four days. And then we had mosquitoes, but uh, very few or no black flies. Most of the time, not too bad. And when, what when the wind settles the down, sorry. What was the date? Uh, June 24th to July 5th. Okay. What did you wear on your hands on particularly cold days while you were paddling? I'm not sure whether I ever wore gloves for paddling. I have neoprene gloves, but when when it's really cold, meaning winter kayaking here in New England, I, I use pogies, uh, but I hadn't brought those. Hmm. I, I know I had gloves uh, for hiking around, just sitting in camp when you're not that active, not producing that much body heat. I don't remember wearing them when paddling. <laughs> so I guess it wasn't that cold. Do you remember what other birds you saw apart from the raptors and the geese? Uh, a golden eagle, a few bald eagles, a uh, peregrine falcon, a uh, gear falcon. I believe a rough-legged hawk. Arctic turn. Did you see any raptors at all aggressive? Um, not on this trip. On the previous trip, we got dive bombed by an Arctic turn that decided we got too close to its to its nest. I have to remember now whether we saw a Jaeger on this trip or whether that was the previous trip. Mm -hmm. um, in Fort Smith, we saw Pelican. I didn't thought they would be that far north. And uh, a little bit outside of Fort Smith, uh, Sandhill Cranes. We might have seen Sandhill Cranes also out there on the trip, but definitely uh, near town. Did anybody do any fishing? Uh, yes. Yes, f f fishing was reasonably good. Uh, we had fresh fish for dinner at least twice. There probably would have been more had we tried a little harder. <laughs> you recall what they caught? I say it again? You recall what they caught? You caught? Um, I think trout, but no, I'm not sure. Hmm. So was your, uh, your daughter the only kid? Yes. How, how does she like that? Uh, she handled that pretty good. Uh, <laughs> well, Initially was a little concerned of try, trying to be super helpful to sort of get a good reputation. But it was interesting afterwards, she told me what was so nice about that trip is the whole peer pressure among teenagers was missing. <laughs> Nobody cares whether you wear the same clothes three days in a row and how your hair looks like. <laughs> good point. Uh, but no, she, she had a good time. She wants to go again on a trip like that. Oh, okay. I found my, my list of birds here in the meantime. And just reading through it, white pelican, old squaw, semi-palmated plover, golden eagle, red-throated loon, Canada geese, bald eagle, hairy sparrow, black scooter, common red pole, semi-palmated plover again, peregrine falcon, yellow warbler, 
a mu gal, although we didn't be under hundred percent sure about that. Robin and the rough-legged hawk, tundra swans, white crown sparrow, Arctic stern, yellow warbler. My wife is a birder. <laughs> oh, thanks. I'm excited to hear about the Harris sparrow. It's on my ball. <laughs> Uh, there was some, oh, <laughs> one, one little adventure on this trip. Uh, so my, my daughter has a nut and peanut allergy. Uh, fortunately not of the anaphylactic shock category. Uh, the guides managed it well, camp kitchen to keep, keep the trail mix with the nuts separate from the one without the nuts and never had a big problem there. One evening, one of the other guests circulated ar around a bag of biscotti with best intentions and none of us was paying that enough attention until my daughter says, I feel some weird itch in my mouth and start to feel queasy. And then you realize, okay, we're actually out, out of the range of a, yellow, of a helicopter from Yellowknife. But yeah, fortunately for my daughter when she ingests nuts, she froze up and an hour later, everything is okay again. So it was a little reminder of, yeah, you're really out there. And things that otherwise would be a minor issue can become a bigger problem just because of the remoteness. Were there other travelers on the river? Uh, we did not see any other group. Here's my question. Um, I'm, I'm Terry Shaw, Lisa Johnson's husband. I'm just wondering um, what type of boats you had on the trip. Um, which maker were they? Looking through the pictures now, whether I see a logo on any of the boats. <laughs> He's a kayaker. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> something craft canoe. Nova craft. I saw Nova craft yep. I saw at, at least one of them here. Uh, the eagle on them. Two or three of them still had a Alex Hull sticker on them. So I think they also got handed down from Alex to Don. I recognize the 18 footers as Alex's uh, as Alex's boat. So they, they were mystery boats then? Uh, okay, I'll uh, jump in here. Uh, That's the best I can tell here. Uh, that say Old Town on the side? Something, uh, something canoe. <laughs> no, they're Nova Craft. Nova Craft. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. From London, Ontario. Uh, 